reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. I'm Jim Buchanan. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you uh, a while about uh, my ideas uh, generally. And I should stress at the outset that uh, I am a man who um, deals in ideas. Uh, that's my line of country, so to speak. Uh, you don't find me out riding on a white horse uh, proposing this or that uh, policy in any direct uh, political action sense. I like to work at the level of fundamental ideas about our social order and the structure of our society. And although I was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Science, uh, I really consider myself more of a political philosopher nowadays than I do an economist. I start from a set, of course, of fundamental value presuppositions uh, in which individual liberty is extremely important to me, and it's important to me how uh, people do organize uh, their social lives. And I like to think that the ideas that uh, we have developed in public choice, which is the research area with which I've been associated, uh, or really a, a, a a version of old-fashioned political economy, uh, how this has uh, perhaps uh, modified people's attitude toward politics and economics and other aspects of their living together over a period of the last uh, three decades. So essentially that's where I'm coming from and perhaps it's good to tell you that at the outset. Well, Jim, does that mean that your primary interest is in process and not the outcome? Oh, very much so. I'm strictly uh, oriented toward the processes by which we govern ourselves uh, or by which we interact one with another in, in our social organization. I think economics in particular has uh, gotten itself uh, off on the wrong track methodologically uh, by concentrating on outcomes or results, allocations of resources, distributions of income, and so forth. Whereas what's far more critical, and really the only thing we can change anyway, is the process by which uh, these outcomes emerge. Uh, that hence my emphasis has always been on, on sort of rules, structures, organizational uh, aspects uh, of, of economics and politics, rather than on particularized results. Well, you're not indifferent to the outcomes. You're simply saying that as a professional, uh, you uh, choose not to deal in that area. But personally, I assume you certainly are not indifferent to outcomes. Well, uh, that's, that's a complex question. And uh, let me try to go through a little bit of, of how I might answer that question. Obviously, we're interested in particular outcomes. but. How do we judge an outcome to be desirable or undesirable, uh, which might attract our interest either positively or negatively? Uh, the way we do that is how we arrive at that outcome. Uh, I'm not interested, for example, in um, observing someone to be trading apples and oranges uh, and worried about the particular outcome or the particular allocation of apples and oranges that will emerge once they're allowed to trade. Uh, my uh, evaluation of that process is basically on the process itself. If I observe the two of you uh, going out and uh, trading apples and oranges, and if I don't observe fraud on the part of either party, and I observe that you're respecting the initial endowments of each other and that you're trading, then whatever emerges is, is, is desirable. Uh, we say an outcome is desirable because that outcome was reached by a process which we evaluate. We evaluate the process rather than the outcome. That's the distinction. It's sometimes a subtle distinction to make, but I think it's a critically important distinction. But you did indicate a commitment personally to, to liberty. Now, you, you therefore uh, 
liberty in that sense is not an outcome, it's an existing state. Is that the distinction? Well, you start, you, 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 uh, liberty becomes important because the, uh, you start with the uh, acting units, namely individuals. I start uh, with a, both a position of methodological individualism and normative individualism. That is, uh, individuals exist as units of consciousness and that's where we start that's the fundamental starting point there is nothing other than individuals in my lexicon of values uh, values uh, find their sources in individuals we don't get our values from some transcendent ideal that's independent of individuals there's no good the true and the beautiful out there in the sky or from god or from reason or from the greeks or anything else uh, these come from us as individuals and we start as individuals as they are the basic units of consciousness and that's the only way to start in my in my view now I agree that's different from classical political philosophy in many respects but uh, fundamentally if you take uh, an individualist position it does seem to me that you are led uh, more or less directly if you think about it uh, toward uh, evaluating all of the interactions of one individual with another in terms of the processes by which uh, individuals uh, uh, operate and of course uh, liberty individual liberty almost is a is a necessary starting point in that uh, in that uh, approach I want to take you back in time quite a ways and and when Jim Buchanan was in high school was he at that point in time in any way sensitive to this to the concept of individualism was that was that something that you you grasped that early in life well I think I was always a very strong individualist in the normative sense uh, I was a socialist at that time uh, during my high school and college days uh, what more or less a populist uh, I didn't understand had no understanding at all of how the economy works or how the market works uh, I've often referred to myself during that uh, period as a, as a libertarian socialist. Now, that may seem like a contradiction in terms, but I don't think it really is. I always place a very high value on individual liberty, but I didn't understand how the market operated, and so I thought uh, somebody had to make uh, economic decisions for us, and it was probably made by uh, an establishment uh, uh, in Wall Street, and uh, therefore... I thought it might be better that if we had uh, democratic uh, decision making for the economy. Uh, once I came to understand how the economy works, I flipped over very quickly from being a libertarian socialist to being a uh, strong advocate of the of the market, allow the market to work. But the the libertarian or liberty aspects of my thinking has been consistent throughout. Uh, you were raised in Tennessee. Yep. Uh, is it correct to say you were a Tennessee farm boy? Very much so. <laughs> I, I understand the Buchanan name has some political history in Tennessee. Well, it has political history in a, in a, uh, a fairly limited sense. Uh, my grandfather was elected governor of the state of Tennessee uh, in 1891. He served a two-year term, but he was elected um, as the as the um, nominee of the Farmers Alliance Party, the only time the populist uh, ever had uh, won a, a governorship in the state, and they only won it for two years and then were kicked out by the Democrats. You see, it was an interesting period historically. In 1891, I think there were six states that elected uh, populist governors. Now, these populists were called different things in different states. In Tennessee, it was called the Farmers Alliance Party. In some states, it was called the Populist Party. In other states, it was called the Grange. Uh, but six different states elected governors that year. And this was an offshoot of the regular Democratic Party establishment. Within two years, the regular Democratic Party had got its house in order, and uh, uh, the populists no longer were, were dominant. But so my grandfather did establish sort of a political uh, aspect of my own background and I grew up in the shadow of his having been governor I uh, grew up in the old house that he uh, operated from when he was governor and so forth Buchanan is Gaelic do you have any particular feeling of affinity toward the Irish and Scots 
Well, yes, uh, the whole uh, my, the racial or ethnic background of uh, um, my own is, is strictly what they call Scots-Irish. Um, I've traced it back, or people have traced it back for me. Um, uh, originated in Scotland, the Buchanan clan is a, is a relatively small clan that comes from uh, near Loch Lomond, north of Glasgow. And apparently my forebears uh, left Scotland and went for about a hundred years in Northern Ireland and then made the big migration along with so many others uh, from um, Northern Ireland to um, United States in the mid 18th century. And uh, my own ancestors uh, came around and were among the first settlers in Middle Tennessee settled a place called Buchanan Station on the Cumberland River near Nashville. Uh, some of the uh, same group, same family, um, settled in Pennsylvania and uh, th three or four generations down the road was the President Buchanan out of that group. And then uh, another part settled in Virginia and of course you find Buchanan as a common name around Virginia. So I do have some, uh, some um, sympathy for the Scottish aspects, and certainly uh, my values generally lead me to be very strong uh, in favor of the Scottish Enlightenment philosophers. That's why I was going to say that, yeah. that your work certainly pays a, yeah. a high respect to a fellow Scotsman Adam Smith. When and did, David Hume. Yes, and David Hume. Yeah. When did you first encounter Smith and Hume in your intellectual endeavors? Um, I'm not sure of that question. I did take a course, I believe, in the history of economic thought uh, in my master's program, but it didn't have much effect on me. But Frank Knight, uh, who influenced me so much along with everything else, uh, did teach a course in the history of economic thought at the University of Chicago in 47, I guess it was. And uh, he spent all the time on Adam Smith. And um, I guess it was really Frank Knight again who, who introduced me to Adam Smith. Uh, the deer and the beaver, Adam Smith's deer and the beaver, the simple exchange models were very important in Knight's uh, teaching, and that had a big influence on me. How much of your career would you credit to chance occurrences as opposed to well-planned out steps? Oh, I think a great deal. I think I can think of many, many um, uh, particularized events that are strictly chance fortuitous for example, I'm an economist by strictly fortuitous circumstance. Uh, at this little undergraduate um, college I went to, Middle Tennessee State Teachers College then, I uh, accumulated three majors, a major in mathematics, a major in English literature, and a major in social science. Uh, they didn't have enough courses to call it a major in economics. And then, uh, given the employment opportunities at that time in 1940, uh, the best uh, deal I could get was a fellowship, and the fellowship happened to be in economics. And I went off to the University of Tennessee to become an economist strictly because that's where the fellowship money was. Had there been a fellowship in mathematics or in uh, English literature, I surely would have gone in that direction. And further, in my college career itself, uh, I only was introduced to physics uh, in my last year in college, but I was very excited about theoretical physics. And had I uh, started earlier in physics, I don't doubt but what physics would have been my interest because that was just fascinating to me. There's a certain sense in which that uh, uh, reflects or uh, demonstrates uh, some of the principles you're very interested in, isn't it? The, the fact that the marketplace works in some ways that are very difficult to discern in advance. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't. Made, I, I've never thought about that connection. That's possibly that that does uh, play a play a role. I've I've always given uh, been willing to uh, be very skeptical of detailed plans uh, that that work themselves out. I think you have to uh, leave a lot for uh, sort of uh, order that kind of emerges or disorder or whatever emerges. I guess it is true that I'm um, uh, I'm influenced a good deal more by happenstance, by accident. Uh, maybe that's the reason that Frank Knight and I shared a love for Thomas Hardy's poetry. Uh, one of the uh, 
many aspects that had nothing to do with economics that Frank Knight and I found so congenial when we talked to each other. Well, you've mentioned a, night, a couple occasions now, and you did your graduate work at the University of Chicago. Uh, I want to ask you a real tough question. Do you have any sense as to why uh, the graduates from the University of Chicago have been so influential in economics? Well, let me say something about the University of Chicago in general first. I did not go to Chicago for graduate work after the war because I knew anything about the economics department. Given my socialist leanings, had I known, I probably would not have gone. I went to the University of Chicago because an undergraduate political science professor of mine who had recently taken his PhD at Chicago in the 30s uh, conveyed to me the sense of intellectual ex excitement of that university. And so I chose to go there. It turned out to be the best decision I ever made because I still argue that there is no place in the world that even is remotely comparable to the University of Chicago in the sense of the intensity of its intellectual interest, intellectual curiosity. And this cuts across departments. It, it applies to the whole university. It is a university that is unique in the sense that people respect and search for ideas. And uh, whether it was economics, whether it was philosophy, or whatever it might be, Chicago just conveys something. Maybe it's because it's uh, situated in a situation where it's not a very healthy, uh, a very pleasant climate, or it's not a very pleasant city to be in in some respects. It may be that, but the, the intellectual activity at Chicago is just, just intense. So anybody who goes to Chicago sort of comes away with, you know, the impact is uh, you work on ideas, and um, ideas are what uh, are the things that matter. And um, I don't think you find that uh, any other place in the world. I think there are too many other distracting elements in most places. Uh, Chicago, by comparison with, say, the Eastern Establishment Universities, say Harvard, um, is much more interested at a level of fundamental ideas. It's not interested in, in uh, uh, going to Washington and saving the world quite so directly. You, uh, the, the, the notion is that ideas matter. Uh, by comparison with the California universities, for example, um, uh, there are not nearly so many distracting elements that uh, keep you away from working on ideas. Uh, and it, it has a, a brashness about it. It's still a, a revolutionary idea intellectually at Chicago. It's a young university, relatively speaking. You don't have all the crusty traditions of an Oxford or a Cambridge. Um, so all those things really help to, to make Chicago kind of an um, intellectual ferment that, that simply doesn't exist anywhere else. Now, um, get to the question about economists um, I think, uh, again, I go back, it might be fortuitous. There might be just accidental circumstance that they had brought together a very exciting uh, set of people uh, commencing in the 1930s with a, with a particularized uh, conception of the way the economy works. And uh, again, I attribute the dominant intellectual influence in that period to Frank Knight Although with Frank Knight, you had uh, men like Henry Simons, Aaron Director, Lloyd Mintz, uh, and then later, of course, Milton Friedman. Uh, but the really original people in the so-called Chicago School were, were Frank Knight and Simons and Mintz and Director. And uh, they put an impact on the way a lot of uh, generations of, of graduate students who went through there uh, thought about the way the economy and the polity worked. And, of course, those students, the students of those people, Friedman, Stigler, Buchanan, uh, also have had an impact on uh, a few hundred other students. And uh, that uh, ferment continues. You would, you're suggesting that uh, anyone today looking for intense, no-nonsense intellectual exploration, the University of Chicago is the place to go? I would say that's true generally. That's true generally across uh, uh, not only economics, but in general. If you really are interested in, in ideas, you go to the University of Chicago. I think some of us who 
uh, went through the University of Chicago um, uh, earlier on have uh, sort of deplored some changes that have happened at the University of Chicago. It has become more like other places, uh, maybe necessarily so, but I still think it does convey uh, uh, an intellectual ferment that simply doesn't exist elsewhere. As an individualist, <coughs> Jim Buchanan constantly must confront the desire on the part of the media, on the part of other people, for labels. And the labels that are constantly thrown out are conservative and liberal. When you're asked the question, where do you put yourself? Uh, how, do you, how do you relate to conservative and liberal as an individualist? Well, that's always a difficult question. I, I appreciated Hayek's uh, piece that he wrote a good many years ago, why he was not a conservative. I've sort of shared with him that position. I don't like the conservative label. Uh, where l most of us who take a kind of a, uh, what would be called an anti-government or anti-state view are, are put alongside the conservatives for that uh, reason alone. But certainly we don't share the, uh, the sort of uh, most aspects of the conservative tradition. Uh, the, I, I'm happy with the classical liberal tradition. I'm closer in the American context to a libertarian than I would be to a conservative. Certainly I'm a long distance away from the American liberal position, which is really a socialist uh, position. In terms of, of uh, more careful classification, I call myself a constitutionalist than I call myself a contractarian, uh, sort of a constitutionalist contractarian position would be more precise. But if you want to stick with uh, sort of uh, more general, uh, more generally recognized labels, I would say uh, classical liberal is perfectly appropriate. In your work, you describe yourself as profoundly ind individualistic in a methodological sense. Would you give us some idea of what that means? How, how do you approach economic problems then? Well, um, I approach, as I said earlier, I go back and start with individuals are the basic units of consciousness, biological individuals. We start with individuals, and that's the only source of evaluation. Uh, we don't have something that's, that's an organic entity called society or community or the economy or the polity. Uh, those things are simply associations or organizations of individuals. Individuals organize themselves uh, for purposes of achieving certain things. Now you, f you fudge that a little bit when you say, well, maybe uh, the family is really the unit rather than the individual, and we do have a sense that we really belong to a family. And, uh, but in part, progress has been made by uh, us becoming more individuals as aut autonomous beings. That had to be invented. Uh, I don't think many people recognize that, but that had to be invented, the notion of the individual as separate and apart from the group to which he belongs. Uh, and that is a major invention in the history of, 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 our, uh, of our free society, I think, uh, that we owe in part to Spinoza and to Thomas Hobbes. Of course, the idea of the individual existed before that, but somehow as an autonomous source of evaluation, not necessarily a part of an organic unit. So if you start with an individual, then how do you start talking about in, uh, economics? You start talking about individuals, you start talking about what they have as an initial set of endowments and a set of preferences, and you start talking about trade, how they might mutually gain. The simple starting point of economics is individual traders, as the Austrian economist von Bauwerk emphasized. You start with traders. Uh, you don't start, and this is a very important distinction here, you don't start with uh, allocating resources uh, amongst uses. You start with two traders with different goods, differing preferences, and you talk about how they might mutually gain from trade. Uh, where you start economics and the way you start economics is thinking about apples and oranges and A and B trading or Crusoe and Friday trading. You don't start with Robinson Crusoe uh, 
alone allocating his time between getting coconuts and getting fish. Now that very simple difference in starting point has profound implications from the way you approach the whole subject matter of economics. You don't build up and get more and more complex into more and more fancy mathematics in which you talk about maximizing the value that you get from an allocation of resources in a whole economy. You don't get a mathematics of maximization. What you get is a mathematics, if you go more and more technical, you get a mathematics which is the mathematics of the interaction of traders or of players. And I've often argued that if you're going into complex mathematics and, and, and complex mathematics can be great help, it's basically game theory. It's the, the mathematics of game theory is the appropriate mathematics for economics, not the mathematics of maxima and minima. So in a, in a layman's sense, uh, you want to bring human beings back into economics. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I don't think they've necessarily got out of it uh, all that much, but certainly that would be appropriate. Uh, I don't object to that statement. Well, in this sense, you, you are, 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 are not happy with macroeconomics. You feel that's a, a, a misdirected... Oh, yeah, I don't think it has any meaning. The, the fundamental, the fundamental uh, uh, building blocks of mathematics are meaningless. There's a word on the blackboard behind you. I believe it's pronounced catalactics. And, uh, and as I understand it, that, that has something to do with this uh, point that you're making. Yeah, catalactics uh, uh, was defined by someone early on as the science of exchange or I would extend that a little and say that science of exchange and contract. Seems to me that's what economics ought to be, uh, or that's what our subject matter ought to be. Ad admittedly, etymologically, uh, economics as a word comes from the Greek, which does mean household management, which does suggest the maximizing type of, uh, or allocating type of emphasis. But it seems to me what our approach ought to be, uh, ought to be the study of how men in individuals in uh, from very simple to very complex uh, patterns of organization how they uh, enter into voluntary exchanges one with another how they make contracts uh, how they reach agreements um, uh, Hayek has called this catalaxy uh, he argues that that's somewhat more appropriate uh, etymologically than catalactic some of the early uh, uh, proponents of this view in the 19th century called it catalactics, but certainly it's a, it's a nice way of thinking about what ought to be our primary subject matter, namely the, an emphasis on the exchange process. In its very simple, all the way up to its very, very complex um, uh, organizational structures, not only in the private economy, uh, but also uh, um, I extend that to uh, politics, and conceive politics basically as complex exchange in which you all enter into organizations to try to exchange with each other to get what we want uh, and commonly share in terms of the benefits of, of political order. And of course this meshes and merges directly into uh, the contractarian tradition and political philosophy. So uh, I think economists who take this catalactics perspective once they start thinking about politics a little, automatically become sort of contractarians in a sense. Well, the uniqueness of your work, as I understand it, is in the app, well, one, in advocating that exchange rather than allocation be the focus of, of economic endeavor, but primarily the application of these concepts to government. Is, is that correct? That you, that you are, in a sense, the, the person who introduced that, uh, that discipline, if you would, to economics? Well, uh, in a sense, that's true. Um, it's, it's extending uh, the economist's approach to um, political process. Now, as I said earlier, the, uh, the contractarians uh, basically were doing that. John Locke uh, was doing that to some extent. Uh, um, uh, Hume, although not normally called a, a contractarian, did that to some extent. Clearly Spinoza uh, uh, did that. Hobbes did that to some extent. 
so this was um, implicit in a lot of the classical contractarian works in political philosophy. But then we shifted away from that and we got this rather categorical and unfortunate separation between the economy and the political sector. And uh, there was an attempt in the last part of the last century amongst European scholars uh, to try to extend economics. They got very excited about uh, the developments in economics after 1870. And so they tried to extend uh, this to apply to the public sector, uh, the sector, uh, the governmental sector. But that had practically no influence in English language uh, economics, and English language economics dominated economics, especially through the influence of Alfred Marshall in Britain, and then, of course, uh, the dominance was taken over by the United States in the middle part of, of this century. Now, my own particular contribution, really, uh, was stimulated in large part, and it goes back to your earlier question about uh, how much is fortuitous, uh, how much uh, is accidental. It goes back to my rediscovery and uh, promulgation of the ideas of this great Swedish economist, Vixell, who was one of the ones in the European tradition, and by far the best one, who made this attempt to extend economics to apply to political process or to, or to apply to individual choices as they uh, make political decisions. Um, he wrote a book in 1896, which is really his dissertation, that I just by pure chance discovered uh, in the stacks at the University of Chicago Library in 1948. Uh, no one had ever mentioned the book. It was not been translated. It was written in very difficult German. Uh, I just happened to find the book purely by accident. Uh, picked it up, started reading it, and it, as I said in uh, a, a little autobiographical essay, it was as if the scales fell off my eyes because here was a man who was saying very clearly things that I had had sort of developing in my own consciousness but uh, could not have articulated or would not have dared articulated in the mindsets of that time had I not had a man like Vixell saying it for me in a way. And uh, immediately got excited about uh, uh, translating and promulgating these ideas. And so I think Vixell, who did try to do this uh, really uh, unsuccessfully, uh, really was a dominant influence on my own, um, my own thinking. And starting with that, uh, my first piece that I published in um, 1949 uh, was really a call of, uh, upon my fellow economists to try to specify at least uh, what model of politics they were using before they start talking about economics as applied to policy. And uh, that, of course, starts my own work in, um, in this area of public choice or the sort of uh, shift uh, of the methodology and approach of the economist, especially the economist who concentrates on exchange, uh, over to try to see what we can say about political process. Well, why is exchange so important in a study of government? Well, ultimately, ultimately, if you start with, this goes back to the individualistic position. If you start with individuals, there is no such thing as a collective. There's no such thing as a government independent of individuals who make up the government. So if you really try to factor a government down, or you really try to factor politics down, what is it? It's simply the institutions or the agencies that we as individuals somehow invent, we design, we lay on for the purposes of getting for ourselves things that we cannot get efficiently through uh, uh, private sector. Uh, in a sense, government precedes the market in the sense that, as Adam Smith quite properly emphasized, we must have laws and institutions which protect our property, as Hobbes emphasized. Uh, you, you need somebody to say what is mine and what is thine before we can start uh, trading. And so we basically have government as prior to the market. Now, what is government? It's an institution which is to help us to get what we want. And how can we give that government or that political structure any legitimacy? The only legitimacy that it has is, uh, is found in some ultimate kind of agreement 
uh, that we agree to establish such an institution. Otherwise, there's no legitimacy for the whole political structure. It doesn't exist independently of, of individuals. So in a contractarian sense, um, government is derivative from the agreement of individuals. And sort of it's, it's, it's analogous to exchange. It's, uh, we agree uh, uh, to turn over to some uh, individuals uh, which might be selected through some processes, uh, power of governance and, and power to make decisions for us. And so basically it all goes back to an exchange uh, starting point. And, and from a constitutional contractarian point of view, your concern is the rules of the game? Yeah, those, those the, the, the institutions the institutions of government, uh, of government are, of course, defined by the rules. I like to think of the game analogy. Uh, it, it, it fails in certain respects, but I don't know anything better. Uh, we describe the institutions in terms of the rules uh, under which individuals behaving as agents under those institutions operate. And uh, the, the whole emphasis uh, is upon the rules, which, of course, come, brings me back to the constitutionalist aspect of my position. Can you give us an example of, um, of, a, ch of a change that uh, you feel might be beneficial? You mean in the current context? In the current context, yeah. in the contemporary. Well, yes, I, um, I, as I said earlier, I do not, I do not, um, get myself into positions out front uh, advocating this or that policy uh, change within the context of the existing rules. My emphasis is on the rules by which ordinary politics operates. And if we're going to get reform, we need to get reform in the rules. I learned that from Vic Sell. Vic Sell concentrated on this. He said if you're going to get uh, improvement, don't look for improvement in electing this or that a better politician um, who after all are going to be directed by the interest of their constituents uh, you get better results better better political if you look at the process and change the rules and incentive structure for uh, the elected politicians so my emphasis has always been constitutional in that respect and I uh, can point to a direct uh, aspect of current policy interest in the 80s uh, that seems to me a fairly direct implication of my position. And this is, of course, what the media has picked up uh, since my award of the Nobel Prize almost exclusively, and that is my support for and advocacy of a constitutional change, a constitutional amendment, if you will, to require that the federal government balance its budget. It seems to me that we uh, have a very seriously flawed procedure. We have a, a, we have a an absence of a rule uh, that requires our political decision makers, our legislatures, uh, our Congress, uh, to uh, pay for uh, what it is willing to spend. And it seems to me this is a procedural question uh, that the Congress, for ordinary goods and services to be supplied by government, uh, should be required to finance through taxation what it is going to spend. Now, classical uh, political economy uh, did allow for the issue of public debt or deficits to finance wars or to finance genuine capital outlay, but uh, through 200 years there was hammered out these principles of public debt issue. Uh, nobody would have countenanced spending for ordinary publicly supplied goods and services by issuing debt. And as you know, we've been running um, a regime of permanent and accelerating deficit financing now for a long time. And clearly it seems to me that's a structural change, procedural change, constitutional change, if you will, uh, that is needed and needed very badly right now. Is another example <clears throat> of, of your interest and focus the question of the, the division of power within government and, and the concerns that we're seeing expressed now relative to whether uh, 
uh, Congress should be in foreign policy, whether the, what the range of the president's uh, authority are. Are those the kinds of questions at a constitutional level that, that, you, de that you feel should be dealt with? Uh, perhaps some of those are political rather than economic, but... Yeah, that, that's correct. I'm not an expert in some of those, but those are certainly the types of issues that, that, uh, that do concern me and which attract my, my interest. I think that um, we are unique in this country and that we do have a set of documents which uh, reflect uh, study by, by men who were good political philosophers in their own right and influenced a great deal by the classical political philosophers. You find the influence of Locke and Montesquieu and Hume and others uh, more or less explicit in our, in our constitutional documents. And uh, we have got away from that to some extent, although I think the American history, American tradition still embodies elements of that. Uh, that, that need reinforcement and need continued reinforcement. Now in respect, I think there are several aspects that are very important. Uh, you mentioned the, the uh, division of, of power, separation of power, checks and balances. There are two aspects of that that are categorically different. Uh, one aspect of that that I have worked on and which motivated me a lot in the early part of my career in particular is the uh, division of power between the central government and the uh, state governments. Uh, that has uh, been lost to our thinking. We now uh, almost go to the central government for everything. I suppose since we fought the, uh, the Civil War, uh, that was more or less the necessary outcome, that the federal government was going to be dominant. Although I think the, the courts have uh, simply gone out of bounds in, in, in uh, assuring central government dominance, essentially a, a judicial history of judicial interpretation that cannot be justified on any ground. Right now, as you suggest, the, the whole problem of division of, of uh, power between the executive and the legislature uh, with respect to foreign policy has emerged as a very important issue. And I'm not an expert on that. But on the other hand, I do think we need to get away and be sure we don't be trapped by the sort of uh, ideas that come across to us from regimes of parliamentary democracy, where the legislative branch is the necessarily the supreme branch. I think the tendency on the part of many political scientists in particular, and certainly uh, understandably so, uh, the people who defend the Congress is to try to somehow make the legislative branch supreme, but uh, our government is a division of powers between the three branches, and uh, to the extent that we are going to remain a viable political entity, I think we have to keep that in mind. Isn't government primarily a coercive activity? Uh, necessarily a coercive activity, um, but I think if we uh, start from, uh, we must keep that in mind. Let me, let me, put, let me be careful here. Uh, we must keep in mind that um, that part of our lives that are organized through government is necessarily a restriction on what we can do. As I argued in my presidential address to the Montpelier Society last year, uh, which I call Man in the State, uh, every, every extension of the state's uh, reach over us uh, amounts to enslaving us because we are slaves to the state uh, to the extent that the state uh, does things that uh, coerce us. We must, in fact, live by what the state dictates are. And that, of course, uh, has the normative implication for me anyway that we should try to minimize uh, those uh, uh, outreaches of the state uh, over our lives. Now that's not, however, to go all the way with the anarchist. In a certain sense, I am a philosophical anarchist, as I've often argued. Um, but it's not to say that the coercive activity of the state is not uh, necessary in many cases. It seems to me that there's an absolute minimal essential uh, program of governmental activity that must be carried out, must be coercive. I don't think, uh, I don't agree with Murray Rothbard and the 
and the libertarian anarchists that the market would take care of all governmental functions. It certainly would not, in my view. The government must provide the order uh, regime in which and the regime in which we live. Now, we can argue about how far beyond that sort of minimal state or protective state or night watchman state. Uh, we might argue as to whether or not there is an appropriate role for other aspects of government beyond that. Uh, but it's because it's coercive that we want to minimize it. On the other hand, because it's coercive does not in and of itself mean that there may not be a role for, for that. But the key here is to try to derive the legitimacy of the coercive extent of the state from some kind of basic consensus or agreement amongst all of those who are coerced. You've offered uh, what I think is an interesting division of labor between the political scientist and the economist, uh, and, and one that uh, kind of surprised me because I always thought of, uh, of the economist as an outside uh, critic of government. And you're suggesting, it seems to me, a different division uh, of focus, that the exchange function should be looked upon within government uh, and it seems to me you've suggested that political science devote themselves to the coercive aspects of government. Well, that's been the way I, th I like to think of it. You see, if you start the way I did, and I've already suggested, you can extend the sign of exchange notion conceptually uh, to politics as well as to the economy. There's really no dividing line. It's the, it's the voluntary exchange aspects, whereas political science might perhaps be there there's also power aspects and this applies to the economy as well as the as the polity uh, in almost every relationship there are two elements there's an element of exchange and there's an element of power there are or in other words putting it there are cooperative uh, and conflict there uh, in, even in an ordinary trade there there are aspects of of uh, cooperation in that trade but there are aspects of conflict too in the sense of who gets how do we divide up the spoils so it, uh, the conceptual dividing line should be between the sort of conflict elements and the, and the cooperative elements. And the uh, catalactics approach, or the approach I take, the exchange approach, contractarian approach, sort of emphasizes the, uh, the cooperative aspect, whereas there is room, call it political science, call it what you want, uh, for the uh, concentration on the conflict aspect. And one of the problems is the question of majority-minority, is it not? In other words, in the sense of, of a contract between individuals and the government to provide service, the coercive element comes in regarding those in the minority who do not agree to have government perform that function. Yeah, and that gets back to the, to the fundamental constitutional uh, limits. Uh, it's critically important, I think, to have the range and scope of political activity clearly defined in the Constitution. Now, there may be activities that, in which we we're must allow, for simple purposes of getting decisions made, in which we must allow majorities to decide for us, uh, majorities in legislative assemblies to decide uh, on this or that policy. But if we don't put any limits or don't put the appropriate limits on what majorities can do, then you're likely to get a situation like we have now and which we observe, um, namely in which majorities in the Congress can simply uh, impose uh, cost on various sorts of minorities all the way across the board without much apparent limits. We come close to being now in what my friend Tony to just say in his fascinating book published in 85 called The State, um, he, he classifies different stages of development and uh, he calls the stage of development uh, the churning state. And what he means by the churning state is where uh, different majorities simply pass legislation which take funds away from the general taxpayer and give it to particularized groups. Uh, and so one majority will go join up to uh, tax us to finance this program. Another majority will uh, organize, another majority coalition will organize to finance that program. Uh, 
and you get uh, everything going just churning about, nobody will gain from all this redistributive activity, this transfer state activity that's going on. Everybody loses, but yet it, it continues. And in one sense, that's because we have not properly kept the government within bounds. We have not kept uh, legislative activity within constitutional limits. And of course, if you're rewriting uh, the Constitution, we ought to go back and really restrict and restrict very severely uh, the range and scope for the activities uh, of legislative majorities. Do you associate your views uh, in, a, in a general sense with the efforts of the Founding Fathers? What was, was, was their effort in forming the Constitution in line with what you feel should be the uh, emphasis of economic concerns in government? Oh, I think I'm very closely associated with what I like to think of as the Founding Fathers. I don't think my position is really very different from James Madison's position. Uh, and I think he comes closer to really representing what was behind the thinking of our Constitution than anybody else. Um, I associate myself very much with that. I think that uh, this tradition has been grossly neglected. I think in a lot of this rhetoric about the bicentennial of the Constitution, its rhetoric and reverence for uh, sort of the documents that exist as they have been interpreted rather than going back and really trying to work out what was the notion uh, that Madison really had in mind. And we've gotten judicial interpretation, we've gotten a history that has gotten away in many respects from that tradition, but I would associate my position very closely with Madison's. Well, why has it taken so long for this approach to be popularized? In a sense, it's been given very little attention, at least in th this century, until the Center for Public Choice came along. Well, um, I think I think you need to to look. I think there are me uh, several uh, reasons for this. Um, and first of all, let me say this, in, in, I, I, I do interpret public choice and my own work in it in particular as being little more than a rediscovery and elaboration and, and articulation, extension of the ideas, basically the Madisonian ideas. That's what Tullock and I uh, thought we were doing when we wrote the Calculus of Consent in 62, which has turned out to be kind of a classic in this public choice theory. We subtitled that The Logical Foundations of Constitutional Democracy. We were spelling out more or less what we thought uh, Madison had in mind when he uh, spelled out the Constitution of the United States. Now, uh, why did we have this uh, uh, sort of gap in our thinking? I think this dominated the thinking of the um, Americans generally, United States citizens generally, and then those who were in the intellectual establishments, those who were in politics for at least a century after the foundation of the Constitution. Um, I think you begin to get some erosion in that set of ideas with the progressive era. Uh, some people attribute a great deal of the source for much that has happened in this century, uh, much of the loss of what I like to call the constitutional wisdom uh, much of that is dated by many uh, people, especially some of my economist uh, historian friends, uh, to the progressive era around the turn of the century. You got this accentuated and developed further by the developments in the um, uh, New Deal as a reaction to the Great Depression. Uh, we forgot about limits in the Great Depression, in partly with some legitimacy because there was an urgency of of need to do something, but we totally uh, neglected constitutional limits. So we wanted to throw the Constitution overboard. Um, we changed our whole structure of governance uh, as a result of the, of the New Deal. And that has sort of got enshrined into, into court decisions and so forth. Uh, there were also ideas in the academy amongst intellectuals, there was very little attention paid to fundamental political philosophy for nearly a century. Um, you had the influence of the idealist political philosophers in Britain uh, that was coming along uh, that really dominated 
this sort of thinking. In economics, it was essentially the utilitarian ideas. Um, so there was a kind of a hiatus in, in political philosophy intellectually. This, along with the developments in the, uh, of, of the New Deal and post-New Deal, so you only, it, the time was ripe, in other words. The time was ripe to, to get back. And so you've had this along with public choice, some of the work that I've been associated with, you've got a rebirth of political philosophy. Uh, Jack Rawls wrote uh, The Theory of Justice in 71. Bob Nozick came on board with uh, Anarchy State and Utopia in 74. So there's been kind of a reflowering of fundamental political philosophy uh, in the last uh, two or three decades, along with the development of public choice. So in one sense, it was a natural outgrowth of, of just uh, getting out of this gap in thinking. Could the United States uh, survive a major constitutional revision? Well, a major constitutional revision perhaps would never occur in a setting uh, that is ongoing such as we would have. You, we had major constitutional revision only uh, in 19... Uh, in 1787, uh, where we were starting up fresh, more or less. Even then, we weren't starting up fresh. We had the tradition of the English common law and a lot of tradition that was embedded in our Constitution. Whether or not we could uh, really have a major constitutional revision of that sort, I think it's very doubtful. I think the Constitution exists, the rules exist, the game is being played. Uh, the problem is how do you change the rules while the game is being played? Now, I'm not one of those who accept that you can't really change the rules, that the rules evolve, uh, and uh, we can expect and hope that good rules will evolve. I'm not at all of that, uh, of that sort. I think that we can continuously reevaluate. We can t continuously look at rules and try to say these are working reasonably well, these are not working so well, let's try to move, let's try to change around the edges. I think, as I've already suggested, that right now we're critically in need of some fundamental changes in our constitutional structure. Uh, we need a, uh, a constitutional amendment to require that the budget be balanced. We also need something done in our monetary constitution. Uh, yeah, the Constitution does give, the, our, our established Constitution gives the power to, to coin money and regulate the value thereof. We have never lived up to that constitutional responsibility. Uh, we need to specify our monetary structure much more carefully uh, than we have done. There are other areas that we can work on. Uh, it's not a question of a constitutional revolution that is needed so much. It's a revolution in our thinking about constitutions that I would like to see us move forward on. Well, as I turn this tape off and leave, as a citizen, is there anything I can do to influence those changes? Well, I think, uh, I think what I stress, and what I try to stress, is that try to understand the distinction between constitutional rules and operation within the rules. And, and try to think about the, the value of having uh, checks and balances, restrictions on the power of our politicians. That's the thing I would leave you with.